All right, welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, and thank you, New York Textile Month and the Adel Court. I'm thrilled to be here today. So, so can I start, Liz? Yes, so yes, Rachel, please do show us the amazing slideshow that you have prepared and tell us, um, tell us your story. Little background about yes. um, who I am. So I grew up on Cape Cod in Massachusetts and my grandmother, um, she was one of those women that could do all things textiles. So we would do all these projects together when I would visit, mostly sewing. So we would go to the um, fabric store, pick out a pattern, pick out the material, and we would make clothes. And uh, she was very industrious. She and my grandfather, um, you know, grew up in the depression era. So there was no really buying things. It was fixing things and making things. So I uh, grew up making things with my grandmother. Um, I, I went to um, UMass Amherst doing, I was an art major doing mostly painting and printmaking, but in my spare time, I was always doing textiles. So then I transferred to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design in 1996, 1997, right? And um, that's where I met Liz. And I was thrilled to be doing, going on a path for learning about textiles and um, never really thinking I could have a career in fabric because remember that was, I, we really didn't use the internet back then. I just liked fabric and had an idea that maybe I would have an art studio in Vermont. Certainly never thought to move to New York City, but that did happen. I'm going to show you some images of my uh, work when I was at RISD. So here I'll share my screen. So that's uh, my grandmother and I a long time ago. And she looked like that pretty much her whole life. Um, and then how do I go forward here? Let me see. Okay, so this is um, a woven piece that I did at RISD and it's a triptych. So there's three panels and I went down to the shore, the industrial shore in Providence and I gathered trash on the shore. So you can see there's pieces of styrofoam and some reeds from the beach and some old like weather rope. And I created this really kind of organic uh, landscape and really um, was trying to think about how the shapes would connect to one another within the triptych. And you can see up close here, um, all the pieces of styrofoam. And this is screen here, so it's see-through in this area. So it was very much about like using materials that I found and then moving on, um, exploring um, different materials. So you can see just using this fat gold yarn, how it kind of warps the perfect geometry of this Dobby weave. And then I was really into printmaking. So my passion in school was uh, printmaking, but I did weaving on the side. So here I did this um, large woven, but then experimented with removing the dye uh, with a print that you can see. So a, a silk screen on top. And then um, my father is a uh, chiropractor. So I've always been fascinated with um, kind of the mapping and the internal working of the body. And in fact, when I was deciding whether to go to art school, it was in between going towards um, like natural health care or uh, art. So this is kind of a combination of the two and you can see I've layered all of these pieces of fabric. Um, getting really hands-on with the printmaking, um, I drove my old Volvo over ink and then drove on the fabric to, to create this printmaking in a different way using my car and then this really kind of aggressive printmaking on the side. And then I became obsessed with uh, layering of these dot patterns. So you can see there's a couple layers of fabric and the way that the two layers shift on top of each other would create um, beautiful shadows and color change. So all of these fabrics were meant to be um, printed fabrics for fashion. And again, I was doing the uh, weaving on the side. So here is um, a lame where I removed um, the metallic area and let the sheer area come in with these lines of dots. And then I started doing a lot of um, drawing with my sewing machine. So thinking about lines in space and how they would create um, 
how they would break up the air or break up the space and using the sewing machine as a tool to draw. So here are some stitches I did on the sewing machine, but then I blew them up to create this larger silk screen and then added shadow behind. Um, and then you can see um, my two fabrics together here. Um, at this point in school, I really started to focus on the subtleties of color. I think in the beginning I was really uh, basic with color choices, but then spent a lot of time to work with the nuances of value and color and tone. And you can see that in these two prints. And then um, this is a piece that I made where I actually made my own latex and embedded strings into it to create those lines in space. And again, using the um, sewing machine to stitch and bringing back some, kind of the elements of the internal body structure. You can see that sort of looks like a heart and ribs, but it's this abstract drawing that I then wove um, in a jacquard pattern and then use different types of yarn to break up the surface. So you can see it up close in these. Oh, okay, so here I am. Um, so I finished school and um, when we were on a field trip to New York, I all of a sudden I realized, wait, you can have a job in fabric? But I never thought to move to New York because it was like so big, I didn't know anybody here and it's so expensive, but a seed was planted on um, a tour that we did, and I thought I should at least try it. So um, I graduated in 99 and got my first job. I, basically, I was just trying to get any job so that I could pay rent. So my first job, uh, Liz remembers, was at a sweater company um, designing theme sweaters for, um, like Christmas sweaters and holiday sweaters. So I remember one of my first designs, I had to do a Halloween sweater and it was ghosts trick or treating. So I had to dress the ghosts up in different costumes. So I had a witch ghost and a, a bandit ghost and the hobo ghost holding a stick and they were all like applique embroidered. So that was exciting. And then I worked at Echo Scarves um, doing prints for fashion. And then I started at Pollock in 2000. So here's a picture of me at Pollock when I first started. And there I worked with Mark Pollock. So that's Mark Pollock on the left. Um, he founded the company in 1988 and he was a great teacher. He's very um, generous with his um, knowledge and his teaching. So when I started working there, I felt like I was, I was almost in grad school because I was learning so many things that I didn't know and learning about the industry and how to construct a velvet, how to construct a, a clip shear and started to work with all of these mills internationally. Um, so it was really exciting and he is um, so incredibly talented and patient. So I worked side by side with him um, for 12 years until he left in 2012. So that was a really awesome time to work with Mark. Um, so here is our studio and it's incredible. It's in Soho. We have large open space. You can see that we have a view of um, the Empire State Building and we are really lucky with our space. Actually, we used to, um, this is on the west side of Soho and we used to warehouse all of our fabrics there um, because it was all industrial. Now certainly um, it's m way too expensive to warehouse the fabrics there. So our, my studio is in our old shipping department. So it's huge and it's beautiful and has gorgeous light. And this is my team. So there are four of us in the Pollock studio. So I should tell you a little something about Pollock. Um, Pollock, we are, uh, a textile company. We create uh, two collections a year. So we have our spring and our fall collection and we create uh, mostly woven fabrics and they're to the trade only. And we work with mills all over the world. And um, we really specialize in unique wovens and they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous fabrics, which I'll show you soon. Um, so here I am at one of our Italian mills. So we work with over 100 mills worldwide. So Liz, if you have any questions or comments while I'm showing these slides, feel free to pipe in. Um, but thank you. I'll just say yeah. this, that I'll, um, 
type the link to your company in the yeah. Q&A. Thank you. Yes, so the, um, the website is pollockassociates.com. Um, so it's just amazing to be having this career where I can work with the best high-end state-of-the-art mills around the world. So we have uh, a mill in New Zealand. Um, we work with a mill in Japan, South America, certainly many mills in India and Turkey, um, um, all over the place, France, United States. And I'm lucky enough to be able to travel to many of them. And I have these partnerships with people for, for uh, the last 20 years. Um, oh, so here's Liz again. So we've been working at Pollock, right? I've been working at Pollock for a long time. And we did um, a collection with five different makers. It was called the Makers Collection that launched in 2013. And Liz was one of the makers. Um, so she brought a different aesthetic to uh, a collection of fabrics. So here I am visiting her studio. Do you want to jump in and say anything about that collection, Liz? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say. It's, it was an amazing opportunity for me um, to work for the first time um, in an interior textile context because I had been working in fashion and for many years and had like, had, had, didn't have as much interest in interiors. Um, but then th through working in the, on this installation project, Knitting Nation and some other things, I started to get really interested in space and light and kind of drift away from fabric on the body and move into fabric in space. And so it was a really amazing, moment for me to start exploring that like fabric and light and architecture and space and so i i really wanted to do um drapery fabrics and um it was such a an exciting moment to be taken into your archive to see all the different possibilities for mills to work with yeah. and right away you know i i glommed onto the mill that does the field coupe, you know, the shear and the cut floats. So here's one of the fabrics that we developed, uh, which is called Zeus, which is amazing. It's woven um, at a fashion mill that uh, worked with, you know, um, the, the most incredible couture fabrics. So this area in the center is sheer with these lines that are opaque. And then you have these crazy clipped lines along the edge that create this kind of like furry vibration. And then you have this really organic kind of stiff deflected linen on the side. And look at what happens like in, in real space. It's just quite a statement window fabric. <laughs> I, love yeah. the, I love the fact that this project was really kind of a launch, launching point for you to get into interiors. Um, and I'm glad that you brought that up about like shifting from fabric on the body to fabric in interiors. Um, just to go back to where I started, I was doing all um, prints for fashion and I was making um, garments, but I did weaving on the side. So when I um, got the job at Pollock, I had this preconceived notion about interiors that were, they were like, oh, it's boring, boring fabrics compared to like fashion. And I found in my experience of working in fashion compared to working at home, that I could be more creative in home and really see my ideas come to fruition. Certainly a lot of that has to do with working for a company like Pollock that is very, very innovative and fashion forward, uh, but I completely changed my brain about um, interiors. I find it like so creative. And it's also slower paced than fashion. Fashion is very trend dri driven and you have an idea and all of a sudden it's gone in six months. But in interior fabrics, you can have an idea and develop the fabric. And as long as that fabric is being sold, it, it will stay alive. We have fabrics that are over 20 years old in our collection that still are best sellers. Um, certainly most of those are uh, textures, you know, plain upholstery textures. So moving on, we have one more slide of uh, Liz's work from that collaboration. And this is Aphrodite and it's this beautiful ethereal lightweight fabric with these long floats 
of um, this uh, beautiful white yarn that just hangs down. It was synthetic raffia, I remember. It was, it's great because it has like this crispy yeah. feel. Yeah, it was like dry sound when the wind Yeah. Um, and some of you who are on the call probably recognize these fabrics as like a distinct part of my current artwork, which is because I started with this project and it was so rewarding on so many levels. And for me, it was the first time that I generated, um, you know, large scale graphic pattern in a textile that wasn't a knit. And with weaving, there was just the, the layers and the possibilities for deconstruction, which is, that's been something I've worked with for a long time. We're so, it was just, it was so full of possibilities. So I asked Rachel and her colleagues if it would be okay for me to um, see if I could do some work with the mill and these files um, to start developing some artwork as long as the, you know, the results were very different and I wasn't making drapery fabrics and putting them out on the market. So it was a, a huge catalyst for me. And I, I owe so much to you and your company, Rachel. Well, I'm happy. It's like you, you've taken it to a, a new, a completely different place. Yeah. Um, so next I just want to show some examples of how we develop fabrics in the Pollock studio. I, I'll, so I'm starting with this, cardboard here. So this is corrugated cardboard. And you can see that we press these vertical lines into the cardboard. And this is something um, that Mark and I experimented with a long time ago for a wall covering uh, embossed design. And it was just in a flat file. We were cleaning out the flat fire files one day. And Molly, one of the designers, pulled it out of the trash and she inked up the top of the cardboard here and then used it to print onto paper. So using the corrugated cardboard as a print and you can see how interesting the mark making is. So sometimes it looks like leaves, sometimes it's really open and airy and it uh, has sort of a, a tread look to it. Then using the computer, so using the CAD as a tool to clean up the artwork and put everything in repeat and also to maintain some of that beautiful variation in the original print. From there, we had it in the file and we emailed it to um, one of our best partner mills in Pennsylvania uh, with the file with instructions for what weave constructions to use and what yarns to use. And here is the resulting fabric. So this is a, a commercial fabric. It's great for a contract. It's bleach cleanable and it looks fabulous tightly upholstered on these chairs. And when you look at it, you don't think like, oh yeah, that's corrugated cardboard, but it's such a beautiful organic texture. So that's how that fabric came to life. And now this next one um, was inspired by uh, this gorgeous Alexander McQueen dress. And what I was drawn to with this dress is the exuberance of the material. It's alive. It's wild, it's out of control. So there's beads, there's feathers, and it's so much about the materiality here. So um, I didn't want to copy what I saw, but I wanted that to be a starting off uh, point of inspiration to create a pillow fabric that was just like over the top with technique and surface. So here are some of the drawings we did in the computer. Um, sorry, by hand and then scanning into the computer where we did, we were using fringe, we we're using embroidery and also beading. And then in the end, this is the uh, resulting fabric called On the Fringe. So you can see here, this is hand woven linen fringe that we've striped with colors. So you can see it's white linen here, black linen here. So it creates this beautiful black and white stripe. And then in the valleys here, this is machine embroidery with two colors of yarn. So you've got the light silver and the darker, darker gray that has, is in this beautiful kind of triangle pattern that looks like three-dimensional studs. So it creates this um, kind of checkerboard with the black and the gray and then the white and the silver. But um, we also chose to use linen yarn because linen has a, a stiff hand and it likes to um, hold its shape. With, if we use cotton or wool, it would have kind of sagged down, but the linen is really alive. And the more you kind of play with it on the surface of the fabric, the more it uh, blooms. 
So here it is as a pillow. And what I love about this is uh, you're sitting on your sofa and if you have that pillow next to you, it's almost alive. It's like a little animal next to you. And certainly in this day bed, it's so wild with this surface. It almost looks like a caterpillar that could kind of walk out of the room. So that is on the fringe. And then my last example here, these are some hand woven pieces from my grandmother. Um, she did a lot of um, traditional coverlet pattern weaving. This is all Dobby woven. And um, I, she was such a great engineer because she could follow the intricacy of these beautiful patterns. And this was a scrap from a bedspread that she wove for her bed and my grandfather's bed. And it was all wool. Um, just beautiful patterning. So we wanted to do kind of a modern take on a coverlet, but weave it um, in very different materials. So here is the hand sketch uh, done in the studio on graph paper. So we always start by hand, even though it is very geometric. Um, then scanning it into the computer to make sure it's the right size for the machinery. And then um, playing with the arrangement of the stripes and the arrangement of color and then working together with the designers in the studio, choosing colors. So um, part of the process of making the fabrics is specking all of the colors and having the mill weave them. It's called uh, weaving a blanket. And then here is the fabric in production. So you can see how amazing it is uh, to work in um, a state-of-the-art industrial mill. I love it. And then here we are editing the sample. So we oftentimes have over a hundred different trials, different color trials, and we have to edit down to make a color line. And in the end, here are the four colors that we chose. This fabric is called Weave On, like Weave On, we can do it. And it looks beautiful on this sofa. But the story doesn't end here. So this is one uh, story that I really love because it's being creative for the sake of being creative. Um, when we were cutting up the color trials, the blanket trials, there were all these scraps of selvage that were all over the floor of the studio. And um, Chase, one of the designers, she picked them off, off the floor and stapled them onto a piece of cardboard and created this beautiful multicolored fringe. So it was just sort of, you know, oh, those are really cool. I don't want to throw them away. Staple them onto the cardboard. But it beca became this other life. Because if you look at it, there's so much interesting patterning and plaids happening. You know, this small checkerboard here, um, larger stripes, odd bits of color just popping out. So we use that as the idea for a flat graphic. And then here you can see the computer printout, the large repeat on the left and large, um, a smaller section on the right. And then we always will check the scale of the pattern on furniture. So here we printed it out in the studio and we're playing it with the scale on chairs because we wanted it to be large scale, but also had to have a really large um, color shift. And you'll see that in this next photo. So this fabric is called analog. It's multicolored. It's also, um, it's constructed for contract commercial. So we do residential and commercial. And look at how great it looks on this day bed. You can see how large the repeat is. Um, actually, you can't even see the repeat here. It's about five feet tall, the repeat. So um, thinking about this fabric, if you use different sections of the fabric on different chairs in the same space, you would have different colors and patterns kind of popping up here and there. And that was the whole concept with analog. Um, and then lastly, I will just run through showing you guys some images of um, the work that we do at Pollock. We do incredible um, detailed embroideries. This is this gorgeous botanical called Nature Lab. You know, so many different patterns, different textures. Uh, this is all outdoor fabric. The pattern, the circles, is a uh, Sumbrella contract. I know you spoke with Greg last week, so we, we also work with Greg. It's called Merryweather. You know, color, pattern, surface. Uh, these fabrics here are beautiful. They are um, part of our pure collection, so that's high-end residential using natural fibers. So there's wool, linen. Um, we're working with Italy and Belgium. 
and I love this part of our collection. Um, gorgeous voided velvet, graphic pattern, color, you know, getting warm, toasty. Uh, this is a really cool fabric. It has hand clipping, so it's embroidered and then it's clipped by hand to create this beautiful little fringe. Uh, it was inspired by chicken feathers. Not such a sexy idea, but if you've ever seen exotic chickens, they are wild. I love this pattern. Actually, it's behind me. See, I've got a chair. I mean, a pillow out of it. It's called Jockey. Um, this is beautiful brushed wool from Italy, multicolored, and then it has this brush finish, so it's a lamb's wool, and it's incredibly soft. So more residential. And then this is an alpaca um, that is woven and then brushed, so all the fiber comes up to the face, so it really looks and feels like a fur. More outdoor. You can see we did a print on the right. It's rare for us to do a print, but once in a while we'll dabble in prints. And then uh, showing some of the awards, you know, we are featured in um, all the magazines. So it's been such a thrill working for such a great company. And then lastly, um, we have our stack, our quintessential Pollock stack. So that gives you um, kind of a view of what who Pollock is, what we do, and um, my own work. So any questions, Liz, <laughs> comments? Well, thank you, amazing, that was fantastic. While you still have your screen up and sharing, I would love to ask you a burning question, which oh, is, no. it, well, um, it's something I've always enjoyed, but also wondered about. Um, you all for years have had a trademark um, signature um, advertisement, like an editorial image that involves um, a person in a great outfit whose face you don't see holding a stack of exquisite fabrics that usually are coordinated beautifully. Um, and I've seen it over and over again, and every time it's amazing. And I just want to know, like, how that came about, and what makes you all keep keep coming back to it. Um, well, it's become it's become a signature of our brand. So for years and years and years, it was just a stack of fabric on its own, um, on you know. Um, just a plain surface, but you could beautifully see all the details of the fabric. So we did stack, 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 and the, the, those were always our ads. And so we were really, you could look at a magazine, you flip the page and you knew it was Pollock because of the stack. But then I think it was 2013, we added uh, the headless person into the stack. And there's something very kind of statuesque about it. You never know who it is, but um, you have this gorgeous, uh, focus on the fabrics, but certainly there is a um, hint of fashion and style in there as well, and connecting to uh, a human as well. So uh, that's where the stack came from, and we'll, we'll stick with the stack. Some, somehow it will evolve, you know. Yeah, I, I like, I mean, this one, to, I'm guessing, is you, um, because of the details, maybe. But um, I also like that um, it always, there's always a hand, like the, it's about the hand as well. Yeah. Like that's part of the story to have a hand um, mm -hmm. involved in that image. Yeah, you'll see that in our, um, our Instagram as well. Oftentimes there's a hand coming in. So there's a connection to the human there. And um, it looks effortless, right? There's this big stack of fabric, but I can tell you like, standing there and like twisting and turning and holding the stack. Um, you know, you get that one picture where it just looks like, ah, oh, the stack floated into the hands. Yeah, you make it look like it has no weight, but now that you're saying that, I, I bet it's kind of heavy. <laughs> um, all right, well, do you wanna unshare your screen? Oh, yeah, 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 let me unshare. Stop sharing. Um, 
I'm trying to figure out if I should do my little tribute now or towards the end, maybe at the end. Okay. Um, do you have a preference? I don't care. Whenever you want to do it. Okay. Um, why don't you do it now? And then we'll, yeah. we'll get into question and answer. All right. So everyone, um, Rachel knows a little about this, but some of it is a surprise. Um, I prepared a small tribute to this amazing person because I just wanted to. And there's some special moments um, from our time together that I thought this audience that you all would appreciate. So um, it's just a little interlude of, um, let's say, nostalgic entertainment and showing, kind of building out um, for you all what our relationship has been. So first, I have, uh, yeah. okay, see this? This is a great picture. This is Rachel in 1999 the in, right. what? The one on the right. Yeah, yeah, of course. And this is, the one on the right is Rachel, and then the one on the left is um, Maya Masuda, who was our weaving teacher, Susan's daughter. I think she's probably around 30 now and um, an opera singer or something like that, living in Canada. Um, so this, these two were met one, two of several people who modeled in my thesis fashion show at RISD. Um, so then just for a moment, let's take a look at this. This is a real treat just for uh, everyone to see. Hold on, bear with me. Okay, just for a moment. <laughs> oh no. This is, yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. You're going to love it. Um, this is just uh, some footage from my thesis fashion show because I wanted you all to see and Rachel to remember this special moment of walking the runway. And then, mind you, this is 90s. Don't forget. Yeah, this was 1999. This was my first fashion show. It was at the RISD Museum in Providence. Um, it was all knitwear. Actually, I remember at a conference, at the Talking Textiles conference a couple years ago, Lee Adelcourt herself said that I should be making this clothing again because it's so relevant. Um, but you know, that was then, this is now. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so this is Rachel's friends, right? Remember that Sarah? I forget her last name. I don't know the pink, but Amanda is coming. Yeah, Amanda Rogan? And I mean, this was definitely not a pro fashion show. I won't make a bunch of disclaimers other than to say that a lot of the hair and makeup wasn't my idea. <laughs> But, um, yeah, what a time that was. It was exciting. I remember, you know, having it in that space in the museum with all the historic paintings. It was, it was shocking and, and cool and edgy. It was. People loved it. Yeah, at the time that that room was the portrait gallery, it, it looks different now, but, um, yeah, it was full of, like, colonial and older kind of portraiture and furniture on the sides and it was great to have this fashion show that was such a stark contrast to everything that you can see the chairs like up above on that shelf so different some of the clothes that I did for this I think are not great and then others I think are fantastic I mean that's what happens with work right some winners and some losers. <laughs> All right, just I a few that. more minutes and we'll get to Rachel. Oh God, please. I, right, there was no Project Runway back then, right? So there was no talk no. about like how to model, how to walk. Nothing, no Project <laughs> Runway. Really, we didn't have internet. No. I mean, were we using the internet? No. I would go to the computer lab to like write an email once a week, maybe. No it, was, it was like at the dawn of, of internet and smartphones. No one had so, no one. Yeah, it's not like I didn't have digital photos and put these all over the internet. We just had prints. It was like, it's like another era. Yeah. 
I mean, fashion was in a very different place because we didn't have like a robust internet culture. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, Great, yeah. Who's that ghoul? <laughs> yeah, that makeup was really. And the hair. Yeah. Gorgeous curls, right? And there's little Maya, she was like, 11. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm sure it would be fun for us to watch the rest of this, but that's not what this uh, moment is about. So I am going to close that up for now. If anyone really wants to see that some other time, just send me an email and I'll try to arrange that. So again, remember, hi, Rachel, you're a great model. And here we have Rachel from the same era at a Halloween party. <laughs> Always with the great, I mean, we all dressed up all the time. So this was actually at my loft um, in Providence. Good choice with the flash camera. Mm. Nice. Right? I, paint, I paint it on my mask and it's stained. <laughs> I love the look on your face. 90s. Now here at the party for the Makers Collection at um, the design building, right? The design center? No, yeah. At the um, Pollock showroom in the d, &D building. Okay. That was wonderful. That was when I first met Cindy Allen. That was a wonderful moment. And what a great collection. What we didn't see in that collection is the um, X-ray fabric or what was it? X-rated. Yeah, X-rated, yeah. yeah. That's right. So Pollock for the Makers Collection designed a fabric in-house that was a response to each maker's work. And so that fabric, that's also a window fabric that's been very successful. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible construction. Oh. Rachel and Coco. So this is Rachel's daughter. And this was when I did a, a design fair with my um, home collection. That was one of my many attempts to have a, a another product related business that was too challenging so i abandoned it studio visit yeah ran into each other in a rainstorm that those are our kids another that was at field and supply yeah it's a wonderful um kind of design market and fair that happens in upstate new york every year it's a great th great event Provincetown. So Rachel and I also have this Cape Cod in common. So this was at my rental place in Provincetown and Rachel and her mom, Betsy, and her daughter are there with my friend Lauren. This is what's called artists who work hard, artists and designers who work hard having some downtime. <laughs> Play hard. Yep. Um, Rachel is, has been one of my longtime um, collectors of garments. That sweater is something I designed. So that's us at her house. And we both travel a lot. This is from Como, Italy. Last when we were, year and a half ago or so. Yeah, not long ago. And then this is from like recently, maybe a year ago or so when we started doing our current projects together that will be uh released in october that's right so um without giving too much away do you mind if i say a few things about that project couple but... couple. couple well just that um rachel and i are working together on a collection um i've designed a collection of fabrics with pollock and um am presenting the collection uh, with Lean Rosé, the great French furniture company, and um, Sunbrella is also involved. And so more on that soon at the end of the month. Yeah, it's very so just watch our Instagrams. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, I'm gonna check the questions. Okay, here's one from one of my favorite people ever, ever, ever. What a wonderful thing to see is Minami Otake, who was one of my favorite students in the whole world. Um, I'm just gonna gush about you, Minami. Minami's question is, it says, hello, thank you for the super great TV. 
How often do you visit your mills around the world? What is the general time frame of developing a new fabric with overseas mills? Okay, um, so I visit um, every every year or so. Well, it's different now with COVID, right? So norm in a normal year, I will go uh, visit European mills a couple times a year, and then every few years, I like to go to India, and. Um, I feel really lucky. There's so much kind of hands-on and learning that I do about the whole um, process of production, which helps me be a better designer. If I can understand um, the mechanical aspects even more than I already do, it helps me work with the machinery in a better way and a different way. Um, so as far as how long it takes to design a fabric and bring it to market, um, it takes about a year and a half. So right now we're designing for um, spring 2022. We're designing for spring 2022. So um, the design process, I will place the orders for the fabric in um, about six months and then we'll launch the fabric in January. So it's about a year and a half. And, but we're well underway for spring 2022. Um, some fabrics take longer. It really depends on the setup of the looms. You know, if it's a multicolored uh, velvet, certainly that will take a lot longer in the color development process because the machinery takes so long to set up all of the colors. Um, some fabrics take shorter, like six months to a year. But um, we're constantly thinking in the future and I never really know where I am or what the date is because um, we are about to launch um, spring 2021. I'm finalizing fall 2021. So there's all these different dates happening, but I love really working so far in advance. Um, people also often ask us, like, do we follow trends? Like, how do you know what's going to be um, in, in the future? And it's really just about following your own um, gut and your own desire and what you respond to. And um, I saw Lee Edelcourt speak um, in Santa Fe uh, a few years ago. And one thing she talked about that really resonated with me was um, this collective unconsciousness on the planet. And I really, really believe in that. And it doesn't have to do with the internet. I feel like it certainly would be there even if we didn't have sharing of all these images you feel something inside of you respond to a color or a surface or a combination of materials and because it looks fresh and someone on the other side of the globe could be having like that similar um, response. So I think just like following your own vision and your own gut, that's what we really try to do. So we're not studying what people are telling us is going to be um, the trend for the future. And I really uh, rely a lot on my design team. This is not just me designing in um, a glass tower by myself. We're talking to one another, we're out there, we're looking and absorbing and um, sharing ideas. Thanks, that's great. And, and um, there's a follow-up question that I'm gonna combine with the question I have. Um, another question from Minami. Um, how are you planning to change the way you work with your mills in this time? And I would add to that um, a side question, which is that I know you all travel a lot to do the work with the mills, but also to kind of s absorb the collective unconscious. And so how does not traveling impact, you know, both the, your work with the mills, but also your kind of um, exposure to the 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 stratosphere of inspiration does it just become more local um well there's part of me it's there's it's kind of a nice break in a way uh it's slightly slowing down where you can maybe spend a little bit longer on where you are rather than moving around all the time so it's spending longer and developing ideas um it has been interesting about uh, with the challenges of sharing fabrics. So the mills, they have their own designers as well, and they present their collections to uh, companies like Pollock and other jobbers. And we might see um, a certain yarn combination 
um, construction, something we like, and then we do our own design within um, that material that they've presented to us. So the mills always show us their new product. So seeing it, seeing something that's so tactile through the screen has been a real challenge. And some of the mills will do a Zoom call, but if the lighting is not right, that's really difficult. Um, the most successful that I've seen is where the mill will take great photographs of their uh, qualities and their yarns and then I'll select what I want then they they send me samples and then I start to work and design and develop with those samples so it's also the same sort of challenge for my salespeople that are selling to interior designers and architects you know if you can't get in front of a person to touch the fabric you have to be creative and so much it is about photography and video now and being savvy with that. Um, so that has become a really big part of my design job. It's not just creating beautiful textiles, it's about sharing knowledge and um, excitement about our product. So that, that's that been all like the webinars and you know, great conversations like this. Yeah, I mean, it's been, um, I guess one of the many silver linings of this whole thing is that people are spending so much time at, home so you know interior designers are really busy yeah. um you know people are overhauling their homes i've been listening to some great talks that cindy allen's been doing with people and also the female design council yeah. you know there's just a wealth of information right now and these live conversations of people in the in the industry just dealing with the realities of this all these changes and some of it's very exciting and Positive. I mean, hospitality is taking a huge hit, as we know. So that's like a major income stream for everybody. There is, yeah. We do a lot of um, we do a lot of hospitality business. So, uh, but thankfully, we're about fifty percent residential, fifty percent commercial. So we yeah. have those luxury um, home items, and you know, it's all about the sofa, right? The life takes place on the sofa. That's right. I feel the same way. Um, so we have a question from someone named Jana Phipps that says, great session, Liz and Rachel. Are either of you addressing sustainability in your work? I'm going to let you answer because um, I've talked a fair amount about that in various talks. Um, one, what has happened in our industry is, um, you know, there's a whole like green, um, push i would say like 10 years ago and it became really popular but then it's like what is green how do you quantify green so what has really changed in our industry is it's called transparency so what is important to each person may be different so natural fibers might be important to someone or recycled fibers or lack of finishes or um better use of energy and water so it's all about being transparent with each individual fabric if i was working with one mill it would be easy to just say here's why this fabric is sustainable but i'm working with a hundred different mills so um the one thing that we have always done in the pollock studio is we have um, always been all about constructing the fabrics to be durable without extra chemical finishes and when i say chemical finishes i'm talking about um, stain repellent finishes and we um, we avoid fr uh, flame retardant finishes so we want the fabric to be as pure as possible without extra chemicals definitely uh, we do have many fabrics that do have backings and some sr finishes but we mostly allow our customers to add those if needed for their application in their project. Um, we do work with a lot of natural fibers, rapidly renewable fibers, and certainly recycled fibers. Um, and we don't, we avoid uh, very toxic, you know, we don't have um, faux, faux PVC leathers in the line. We um, tend towards more polyurethanes or silicone. So that's how we're addressing sustainability. Um, and you know we are we try to give if we have extra fabric we give it to people that can sew or use it for other purposes rather than uh putting it into the landfill i took some home the other day <laughs> when you come over to my house next you're gonna see it's covered in pollock textiles 
Um, I'll answer it just briefly. I don't want to seem like I'm avoiding answering that. I, I deal with sustainability in major ways. I've been working on this program with Sunbrella for a couple of years now of um, upcycling salvage loom waste. I call it salvage fur. So um, that's, a, that's a big way that I've been doing things along with just the, my general creative practices of material driven kind of problem solving, like working with what's available versus buying new things, um, which can sometimes be problematic for the materials industries, you know, but there's a glut of material in the world that can just be used. I, and I know a lot of people who work that way with dead stock fabrics and whatnot. Um, and also moving elements forward in different installations instead of making new furniture each time or new carpets each time. And then it also creates this nice kind of continuum of a visual vernacular of my work. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions. Remember, you can, um, if you need to, well, what? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> Here's someone says, can you please repeat the name of the summer textile retreat you mentioned? Um, Paula, I think I just said Cape Cod, which isn't a textile retreat, but rather a place that Rachel is from that is like beautiful coastline and a place that I go. Um, I think that's what it was, right? Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. There, there aren't any textile retreats there, but um, maybe we should start one. Maybe, or just bring your, uh, bring your knitting to the beach, you know, make something wherever you are. I mean, I do, that's like my MO, the needlepoint on the beach, unstoppable. Uh, okay, so next we have Chital says, since you are talking about finishes, what kind of finish would pieces like the feather and fringe inspired piece have? Um, the, the, the Liz Collins pieces that we did with the Makers Collection, the feather and the fringe. Oh, oh, the, um. Maybe the embroidered with the. On the fringe fabric. Um, yeah. That has no finishes. That's all hand woven um, in India. So um, it's completely raw. It's a linen ground and then it's embroidered with a viscose yarn and then it's hand woven with linen yarn, the fringe. Um, so that's a pillow fabric. The, the, when I speak about finishes, the industry that uses finishes is going to be um, mostly hospitality. So for hotels, you know, they're going to put a stain repellent finish on the sofas, on the, um, on the furniture because it gets so much use and certainly in public spaces. So, but we have fabrics that people use in their homes um, that are constructed for hospitality but we don't put extra finishes on it because someone might not want that in their home. So we allow our customers to, um, to add that if they want it and we can add it um, for each order at a different mill that does finishing. Okay, thank you for that answer, Rachel. Um, here's another one. Well, first I should say someone named Christina says they have a house on, in Cape Cod and would love to have a textile Retreat. So, okay, Christina, Christina, let's be in touch. <laughs> um, Louisa says, fabrics that you can clean with bleach are normally very harsh on the environment. Do you use specific types of acrylics that won't shed as much and are friendlier? Uh, well, bleach, for a fabric to be bleach cleanable, it um, needs to be made of a solution dyed yarn. So a solution dye is where the color is added into the fiber in the liquid stage. So it's molecularly bonded with the fiber. So it's a synthetic dye. And we use um, synthetic dyes uh, because they're light fast in the home furnishings industry. We do not use natural dyes. Um, certain dyes are more toxic than others. But in a solution dyed fabric, um, you can clean the fabric with bleach without the fabric fading. So um, that is just a specific way of dyeing a fabric. And that is done with um, polyolefin or acrylic. I'm getting very technical here, Liz. Well, it seems that we have some very technically oriented guests here. So in order for a fabric to be bleach cleanable, it has to be solution dyed or use high energy dyed polyester. And that is um, a, uh, 
a polyester that's dyed at extremely high heat so that the um, dye stuff is bonded so tightly with the fiber that you, it won't fade with a diluted bleach solution. Um, so I don't think that those are more toxic than other synthetic fibers out there on the market, like other polyesters or nylons that are being dyed. Um, it's if you want to if you want to avoid um, using synthetic fibers, um, there are certainly beautiful natural fibers out there, but they would not be appropriate for commercial use unless it's like a it's like a, a very well constructed wool. I could go on and on, Liz. I know we're at our time limit, but don't get me started about like dye stuff and. You know. Yeah, I mean. I think you're preaching to the choir. I could go on and on too. That's what I said at the beginning is that most of us, I'm, I'm going to assume that most of us who are on this call, if not all, have some kind of deep passion for textiles. And so we could spend all day talking about these things. And when we meet each other and can get into shop talk, it's really exciting because it's, it's specialized um, information. But on the other hand, it's this, like textiles is this realm that everybody is around every day in every moment. And it's one of, it's like as old as time, right? Fur and, you know, the, the, so with that said, Unfortunately, we need to wrap this up because we could talk all day. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled to be part of um, New York Textile Month and through you and um, it's been such a pleasure. And again, we could go on and on, but I just love sharing with people that are interested in all this. We are like united as textile nerds. Indeed. Um, I, I don't really know how to, type these it's a little bit confusing because it's not a chant chat so um if i did like just to give you our instagrams let's see if people can see this um what's your instagram rachel doris it's pollock textiles right it's the one where you can see all the great fabric you just right my that's what we want to focus on <laughs> so here here are our, um hopefully people can see this i just en entered it under someone's question or someone's comment if you can't just um google and you'll find us anyway um thank you all of you in the um the q a for saying such nice things there are a lot of people saying thank you a lot of people congratulating, enjoying it. So um, thanks a lot, everyone. Hi, and everybody. Thank you. Enjoy your day. And thanks, Liz. Thank you, Rachel. Have a great day. And thanks, New York Textile Month. All right, signing off. Bye. Bye-bye.